talk to you about some of the basic building blocks of digital marketing. And um, the slides that I'm showing you are, are pretty broad, and I'm going to get some detail and talk to you a little bit more about some specific things as we roll into them. So the first thing to think about is three distinct areas, owned, paid, and earned. Uh, how many of you have heard that phraseology before? Anyone? Okay, man, a little bit. Yes, okay. So the thing about them is, let's see, oh, there we go. So owned is what you control. So if you think about all of the things you market, both um, offline marketing and digital marketing, it's the things that you absolutely control. For example, anything from a brochure and a flyer, which you would consider to be in your more offline space, less virtual space, to your website. As long as you are hosting your website and you are paying your hosting fees, then you own and control that website. The only reason why that website would go away would be if you stopped paying for it or the hosting company ran into problems. And then there's the content that you create and have, but you put that in different <coughs> places that may or may not be places you fully control. Think of social media content, right? Social media platforms. You own the content. The content is yours. But the platform is more like a rental unit, right? It could go away. It could change. Paid is you're paying for placement of your message. Advertising. All, it's just wherever you are paying someone to put your message out there, then that's your advertising spend. And then what others are saying about you and your business, that's earned media. So traditionally, that's getting the local newspaper to write about you. That's getting on a radio talk show. Uh, now, with all the different digital tools you have, that could be anything from people sharing a post you put on Facebook to um, somebody writing a review about your business on Yelp. You didn't actually pay anybody for that, hopefully. And you didn't write the content, but somebody else did. And that's usually, it tends to be that people who are looking up information about your business will trust others' point of view about you more than your own or when you pay for placement of your message. Right? Even though you're paying advertising dollars, people tend to not to trust advertising as much. Uh, but they will trust if your business has five-star rating on Yelp, for example. Oh, I feel good about that, right? So when, when you think about it in that context, then before you really start digging into, I want to put a post on Facebook, or I want to pay money to put an ad on seven days digital, you really want to think about what is your overall goal. So I saw there's a lot of folks here who have different kinds of businesses and different kinds of things. If it's not to sell a product or service, which is sell a product, which is kind of e-commerce, if you're not actually selling direct online, but you have a service, or you're trying to drive people to an offline location, like a brewery or um, a retail shop, you have to really think about what do you want your online content to do for you? What is the purpose of everything you're doing? Who are the people you're trying to reach? Who's your ideal customer, for example? Right now, I know you've had some other uh, sessions before this to really talk about that kind of thing. How do you identify who your, ident who your perfect or best target customer is? And think about which tools are going to be best used to reach those folks. Email may be better than using a tool like Facebook. Or a flyer at times can be more powerful than your website. Other times, a video put on YouTube and then shared on different platforms can do more for you than anything else. So knowing where your target market is helps you know how you can best reach and engage with them. And this is not much different from um, less digital and more traditional 
methods of thinking about what magazines would be best for my target market, what newspapers might be best, where might, where might I want to get placement in a specific newspaper. Um, it doesn't matter whether the platform is digital or non-digital. It's where's your customer, how do I reach it? What's the best tool? That's it. It's actually pretty simple, except now we have a lot more tools. And the tools shift and change, uh, especially in the digital space. And then really thinking through, and this is where things get more complex and have gotten more and more complex with the way the tools are changing, especially when you think about social media platforms. So when you're thinking about things, um, uh, using something like Facebook or Instagram or even Twitter, any of these social platforms, because they keep changing, how you can use them best keeps changing. And what part is effective or not effective keeps changing. And that's probably the most complex part of digital marketing today. That's what I would say. Okay, so the first step is, um, have anybody heard here about the inbound marketing approach? Inbound. Anybody? Got a couple, maybe? Okay. So in a, in a more traditional marketing approach, which a lot of us are familiar with, a company or a brand pushes out advertising to you to say, buy my thing, buy my thing, buy my thing. And I'm just kind of continuously doing my best to get at you. But I'm not really providing you a lot of value, really, unless you really like my product. But over the long haul, I'm not really helping you outside of, you know, buy this thing from me. And an inbound approach, which is a, a beautiful mix of uh, marketing and lead acquisition and sales. Right? It's really great sales funnel process. It, it leverages how digital works really, really well, which is as a customer, as a consumer, as a Simple human being, when I want to know something today, where do I go first? Google, Google right? I mean, you know, I know how to not do that. I was around before Google, <laughs> right? I, I know there are ways to get answered, but, you know, every single time. Oh, I don't remember this thing anymore. Let me go to Google. If you are doing your job really, really well in marketing, you know, what is it that your customer, what are their pain points? What are the questions they need to ask? What do they really care about? Um, I overheard that you have a boutique mm -hmm. for resale, mm -hmm. a high-end resale, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so what is a, a problem that you solve for your customers? What is something that you I love it when a customer comes in and says, I'm looking for this, or I need this for this occasion. Yeah. And I've done styling since I was right? teenager. Okay. So, that is like the best customer that could walk through the door. Right. So how do you create content online for that customer? That's, you just gave me that idea because yeah. that's what I need because to do. Imagine, imagine that that person is sitting in their house mm -hmm. and they're thinking about this thing they're going to have to do, but they don't know you exist. And they're going to go to Google and they're going to be asking that exact question. How do I find, um, I don't even know. I don't even know what I would ask, because I don't know what products you offer. Is it clothing? Is it furniture? Is it a mix clothing, of all clothing? Accessory shoes. OK, so I have this great event coming up. I want to I want to look a certain way. I want to have something that's a little bit different and unique. Um, so I might say, well, uh, how do I find unique clothing style for an event here in Vermont? Right? I don't know. I mean, this long tail searches. People aren't typing clothes, Vermont, right? They're writing sentences or questions or they're looking for a stylist. They're looking for a stylist. Or now, um, anybody in here have Alexa or Echo or Google yes. Voice or any of that stuff? So now they're just asking the question in natural language form. Well, if you do your job really well from a content perspective online on your website, and you already write content that answers that question, 
how to find the right stylist for a local wedding. How to, I mean, I can't even think of the things that you might know, but you know, you know exactly the kinds of things people look for. So what kind of blog post could you write? The five things, the five must-haves that you can get from a resale boutique or vintage clothing that gets you to this event. And you write that kind of content and you put that out there. So here I am. I don't know you exist. I am in a moment of need. I write this on my Google thing and bam, here's this post from you. I'm like, this is really good. And I click on it and I find out you're local and then right next to it is a way I can call you and maybe I pick up the phone. Or maybe I come in. Or maybe I send you an email. The challenge is to meet me because you don't know I need you until I need you. And so the inbound marketing approach is you create really good content that provides value and answers the challenges or problems or questions that your target market has and does it in a way that Google likes and then I find your content. And when I find your content, I interact with you. When I interact with you, do you capture my email address? Because as soon as you do that, then you can start sending me emails. Not like every day, but especially if you're a small business, you can keep a list of, oh, well, well, that Elaine, she really likes hats, and I know these are the kind of hats that really work with her, so when I get something into the store, I can say, hey, now we've got personalized service. And so the inbound approach is really providing content and information for all the people out there who might need you. And they'll come to you when they need you. They'll be happy that they got the information from you. And then they'll keep coming back. As long as you know, have the product for them and you can fulfill what their needs are. Then you can use different digital tools to kind of keep that going and retain those customers and then get them to talk about you and become earned media and content for you. So it's a wonderful process. Um, it started through a company named HubSpot, actually uh, born out of a UVM alumni who's now Boston. And uh, they have a whole content management system and a whole bunch of tools that people can use to help them do that. For a small one-person business, that's kind of hard because you're not necessarily going to have that kind of um, ability to work with all of those tools. But they have a couple free ones that you might find useful. But you can do this very simply with a spreadsheet and a little, you know, an email database or even Google, right? Google Docs, Google Drive, things like that. Um, so you can start here and then work your way up. But really thinking about that content, and then how do you take that content and put it across the different platforms that people are going to engage with and see? So I want to direct you to this, your content platforms in owned. I want you to really think about the platforms that belong to you, that you absolutely control. Website is the hub. Uh, I can't emphasize enough to everybody, especially when you're starting out, uh, there has been in the past this idea that all I need is a Facebook page. And I, I cannot tell you how important it is that that is a very not good idea. Uh, one, it's rented space. And two, because of the way the platform keeps changing and the shifting demographics and how they're using that platform, your content can go away. People will find your content. The people you think you're seeing it aren't seeing it. So your website, you know, is yours. You have control over it. You can put your content there in the way you want. Um, now, email marketing is also owned content. Well, you may be using a platform like MailChimp, which I recommend because it's free and can be very useful, um, up until MailChimp. Up into a certain amount of, of emails that you send out a month. So if you're a very small business, it's a really great entry place. And as you do better, you will end up having to give them money. But you can start for free. Your email marketing, you can control because you're deciding who gets what from you when. And you're not just sending out blanket emails to everybody every time you sneeze, right? 
What you're doing is you're thinking about what are the needs of my customer and how do I provide them value very specifically. So this gets at marketing in a really, well, old school sense. If you were a direct marketer and you've done direct marketing, then you know what to do. If you're a catalog marketer and you've done that in the past, like pre-internet, you know exactly what to do. You know how to segment a list. You know how to, the ways in which to think about the kind of content you would send out. Just be really intentional about it. And then this video and audio content. So videos you create, podcasts. So I'm not quite sure when this happened, but they're like a while ago, like years, people were talking about podcasts and everybody was like, I don't know about podcasts. And now suddenly podcasts are all the rage, right? You know, BPR is like, check out our podcast, check out our podcast. So the beautiful thing about that is depending on your service, if your service is about advice, if it's about, I think I overheard you talking about decluttering, wow, you know, three minute podcasts about ways to declutter different things that people could kind of listen to as they're driving or put on and as they're cleaning the house or doing something as like kind of a coach. How cool would that be? Well, that's content you own. You can put that on your website, and people can come to your website for value, right? So social media platforms, if you see, I've got that kind of grayed out. So again, I want to highlight that that's rented space. They change a lot. So it is essentially like having an apartment. Your furniture is in there. But the landlord can come in at any day and paint the walls a different color. The landlord can change it however they want. They can come in and say, you need to leave. Right? You don't have any control over that space. So think about that in particular. Uh, because that's an important thing to, to make sure that you are really thoughtful about how much work you're putting into rented space and making sure you get value out of it appropriately. <clears throat> and then your perfect materials, because you own those. Those are yours. And your offline, con your offline content that is not digital should look and feel the way your digital content does. And they should work together. And are they doing that? Because it's not just about, well, it's a completely different medium, therefore I don't have to. No, they should come together so that I know your brand across all platforms. Yeah. So now I want to get into this. Talked about this rented platform. So I've got our little logos up here. We've got our Facebook, our Instagram, our Twitter, LinkedIn, and Snapchat. And then there may be others that are important in your particular industry. Facebook and Instagram are both owned by Facebook. Now, there's a lot of issues going on with Facebook right now. <laughs> That's for another time and another discussion. So I'm going to focus on it as a marketing platform. And one of the things that's, um, that I think that people lose sight of is Facebook's been around now for quite a while. Uh, it's been an open platform for over 10 years now. And when it first started, it was like the holy grail of marketing. I can post a thing for free, and all of the people who liked my page will see it. And they did. And they liked it. And they shared it. And that was, like, amazing. And Facebook wasn't making any money. But they got me hooked in, right? My friends are there. The brands I like are there. It's this beautiful space. And I have this news feed. Oh, here's this news feed. And now I can see all this content. And then they started providing advertising opportunities. But who looks at that? Who cares? On this side, I don't even care. And as a brand, I'm still posting, and you're still all seeing it. But they need to make money. And they changed their algorithm, right? They changed how individual people get to see the content there. And they moved it in a way so that now, today, 
if you, how many of you have a Facebook page for your business? Okay, how many of you can look me in the eye and say it is successful? Okay, I've got a, yeah, and, and why is it successful? Tell me how that is. Uh, people seem to really enjoy, um, so I'm a furniture maker, so yes. whenever I do a new piece, yeah. I do like a progression of beginning to yeah. end. So that's very interesting. People like that kind of content. Do you post that on Facebook? Facebook mm -hmm. videos? Do you post um, it on YouTube? It's all, all picture content. All pictures, so yep. images, yep, and you images. post that in Facebook. Okay. Yep. And how do you know they seem to enjoy it? <clears throat> Their comments. Comments, okay. Yeah. Um, do they buy your furniture? I have repeat customers. Good. So that's, that's good. Good, okay. I'd like to see a lot more okay. coming from it, but... Um, it's kind of nice to have a visual record as well. Yeah. That people can go back and see, okay. you know, five, six years ago. And, and is that visual record on your website? Yes, it is. Excellent. Very good. Yeah. Because what happens if, is everybody really seeing the content on Facebook no. that you want them to see, right? Um, so what you have is some really nice engagement. And so the purpose for your Facebook may not be about selling your product, but to keep people engaged with your brand. That's right. And if you know that, then you can say, all right, but can I leverage those people to buy or to talk more about me so I can get new customers? So yeah, yeah. Um, but where Facebook is now, if somebody doesn't interact with your content, they're not gonna see it. So you can post something, and essentially what Facebook does, and this happens very quickly, so keep this in mind. This is not a five-day process. This is an instantaneous process. You post your content, and they send it out to a small percentage of the people who like your page to see how many people will engage. If there's enough engagement, then they'll send it out to more. Um, even with that, uh, less than 10% of people have the potential to see the post. So of the people who have liked your page, less than 10% of the people will actually see that post or have the potential to see that post. Does that change when you sponsor them? Well, see, now we'll get there in a minute. Okay. <laughs> I'm talking about organic content. Okay. We'll get to the paid section in a minute. So if you're putting a lot of effort into Facebook, your rented space, because people seem to maybe like it, and you're not putting effort into your owned space, your home, your website, and driving traffic there, where you can measure if people are actually doing things, then you're beginning to run into some challenges, right? While Facebook has insights and information to tell you about engagement metrics, if those are not translating to sales, then are you, or, or moving your business forward, is this a place that makes sense for you? This is a real important time to be asking that question. Who are the people who are in Facebook? Are they the people who are your target market? And does that work for you? Instagram is similar, very visual, really cool space. For a furniture maker, that could be a really cool space. Twitter. Anybody using Twitter in here? A lot of people are like, I don't know what to use with Twitter for. Um, <laughs> for some, it could be really, really useful. Most? I don't know. For small businesses, I don't know. You'd have to do it really, really well. If you are a law firm, if you are in the political realm, especially locally, you could do really well using Twitter. If you are media, you could do really well using Twitter. Furniture maker, eh, not so much, right? I just don't think that that would be the best place for you. Why? Because people go to Twitter for real-time news and information. If you have that kind of business, then that can work really well for you. If not, then it's probably not a place for you to be. LinkedIn can be really, really good, but expensive on the paid side, but can be great for building networks, especially if you're in, say, real estate. That can be a really great place. Okay, Snapchat. Anybody in here using Snapchat? So, so I use it not for business. I remember people talking about that for Facebook, by the way. I've been at this long enough where I, I remember that, right? And I remember people saying Facebook. I was too old for Facebook. 
Uh, so if your target market, if the people you want to reach are 14, 15, 16, maybe up to about 22, if you have something that they want, then you should be in Snapchat. And again, it always comes to who is the person you are trying to connect with and how do you do it well. Yeah. You, would st you don't think that age is up a little bit into the 20s? So um, the only reason why I said 22 is because I work with college students right now who are the 22-year-old, 23-year-olds, they're kind of using, they use Snapchat, but they use it with their friends. And they are struggling with the transition Snapchat is making to more advertising-based content. And younger people are perfectly fine with it. And so with Snapchat, having a, putting out snaps for small businesses, probably not so useful, but ads could be. Right? And so, so that's where we get into paid. And this is where we get back to your question, right? It is wherever you pay for placement of your message. So for Facebook in particular, what they want you to do is they want you to sponsor or boost your post. <coughs> okay, let's be clear, that's advertising. You are paying them to put your message in front of more people. That's it. That's pay placement of your message. So a sponsored post is one I wrote this organic one. It feels like it's doing pretty well. People are engaging on it. We'll think about our, um, our furniture maker back here. People are engaging. It feels really good. Let me throw like 20 bucks to get that so more people see it. And let's see what happens. Boosted post. Well, boosted post is when you do that. Sponsored post is when you have not an organic post and you just create an ad that's native advertising in the space. So you may not have that content on your actual page, but it will be seen by more people. Random people? Oh, no. Friends no. Well, well. So Facebook uh, is probably one of the most interesting places to highly target your content. So, if I might take some liberties uh, with, with your brand a little bit, with a sponsored post, you could create a post that shows a set of pictures, and you could decide it's going to be a buy ad, because what I want people to do is buy this table that I just made. And then you can say, all right, I want this to go out to, uh, so who, who's your best buyer? Give me some attributes. Um, tend to be... Wealthy. Okay. Um, High socioeconomic. I'll check that box. Yeah, and they love to design their own. They have a need. Okay. And they like to be involved with the design process. Okay. All right. So they want custom work. Yeah. Okay. And what are some of the things that they like to do? They like me to make prototypes. Okay. But do you know what they like to do that have nothing to do with your business? Oh. Um, what kind of cars do they drive? Um, well, some of them are pilots. Um, oh, they fly. Okay. Yeah, they fly, they travel. They travel, okay. Okay. Yeah. So they have maybe, they definitely have one home, maybe two. Mm -hmm. Okay, are they just in New England? Or they tend to be urban, rural, or are they, you know, suburban? Right now, mostly Shelburne, Charlotte. Okay, all right, so you could, for not too much money, do a sponsored post that shows your process with a buy button. You could target to people of a certain income, literally $200,000 a year or more, who live in Shelburne and Charlotte, click, click, who like to fly planes, click. Yeah. Wow. Okay, uh, this has gotten Facebook into some trouble too, by the way, if you want to dig deeper into some of the challenges that they face with this. But from this perspective, you can get really highly targeted. So for some of you, that can work really well as long as your target market is in Facebook and using Facebook because you can highly target it. Instagram is similar because it is part of the Facebook family. 
Snapchat is pretty good. They're still developing what they're doing. Twitter's not too bad. LinkedIn can be pretty good for advertising. And then we get into our Google AdWords. You all know that, right? Your search engine marketing, where you see the ads that pop up first in search, and Google Display Network. The difference between the two is Google AdWords are the ads that show up when I type in a search in Google. They are the word ads that show up before the organic content. And they have pretty good return. You can pay, depending on what you're doing, you could pay 50 cents a click up to 10 or $15 a click, depending on how focused your keywords are. And there's a whole strategy and a whole process to that. If you are a small business and you want to delve into this world, I actually recommend having somebody do it for you. I really would, because it takes some time. But it can be pretty useful to drive traffic to your website, to just get people here, let them see what I have to offer, right? Um, in your case, if you're talking about how to stylize for a wedding or do some of these other things, you might drive people to specific content that answers their problem question, right? Or you could even do an ad is how do I find the perfect table for my unique home, right? Google Display Network is um, picture ads, for lack of a better word, that go and almost anywhere across the web. So some of you might have heard of Breitbart. People in here, I am doing, I'm doing a little politics, but it's a great example. So Breitbart accepts Google content. Google Ads. Most publishers do. So you have the Google Display Network and you can say, I want my ad to show up on websites all over the place where people who care about furniture will show up, who fit these demographics. Well, from a political standpoint, right, you might have very liberal folks, you might have very conservative folks, they all fit into the world that you're talking about. Do you want your ad to show up on Breitbart? Because if you're not careful with the Google Display Network, that could happen, which is why you hear a lot of people freaking out about stuff like that. It's because I am setting out my ads to a criteria, and if the publisher fits this criteria, my ad will show up there. And the reason why my ad will show up there is because Elaine came to my site and looked at my furniture, and I'm looking at furniture, and I'm looking for furniture, and because Google does what it does so well, I'm gonna go over here and maybe I'm reading Breitbart, your ad's gonna show up. That's because I went to you first. <laughs> it's not because you are intentionally saying I only want to advertise at this particular website. And so knowing how Google Display Network works and how the content comes together is really important because you can block certain sites from showing up, you can focus on certain sites showing up and your ads showing up in certain places. But that's your, that's your image, work, image ads versus your text-based ads that show up in Google. And then of course I put on our local folks, right? Our radio, our TV, our newspaper, that's all paid advertising, right? They all take all of these different forms. Make sense? It's, a, it's pretty complex actually. A lot that goes on there. We don't have front porch forum on here. I don't. I thought about putting that there, and I should have. You're right. Front porch forum is a great place, especially for local. If you're hyper local, that's a great place to do advertising and even a little bit of you know commentary and getting people to talk about things that matter. Right? What was that called? Front porch forum. Yeah, I live on. Oh, that's so great. I am very focused right here in Williston. Yeah. And that is what I use. Customers talk about me. Yeah. And it, it can be a great, great tool. Absolutely. You can be hyper local with a set of things, but Front Porch Forum, if you have it in your neighborhood, it's awesome. And you can do advertising with them across different, um, different I guess, neighborhoods. Neighborhoods. Yeah. Additions? Neighborhoods? Yeah. 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 So it's definitely a good one. I should have put that up there. So earned, PR and influencer marketing. So I love this chart. Um, this is uh, from a, a blog and they're talking about earned media. And a lot of us know about the whole news media mentions. It's like, can you get that article in seven days that talks about your new business and why it's really cool, right? That's awesome. We love that. 
but review sites are really important. And then influencers in your industry. So who does your target market pay attention to? And can you get that person to talk about you positively? It's a really interesting question. A big part of public relations now has moved into this space of reaching out to bloggers and influencers to say, hey, we see that you write about furniture. We see you write about vintage clothing. And I have this shop, or I do this kind of furniture making. And I have this great post that might help your readers learn about this. Why don't you check it out? And they might take a look at it, take a look at your site, and then say, wow, this is really great. And then the, they have a big following, and they say, my goodness, this is the most, have you ever seen a table more beautiful? <coughs> check this out, and check out this website, and see all these really great pictures of this in process. And then, it's kind of like getting a really good article in seven days, right? People come to your website. You can actually see if you're using an analytics tool like Google Analytics. Okay, they wrote about me over here, and oh my gosh, look at my website traffic went like this. And my referral traffic from that one website, it didn't even exist before, and now it went like this. Wow, that's really great. And maybe from that you actually got somebody to buy something from you. Hopefully, that's the goal, right? But there's something else that's really important about earned media. And this is where we back up and go back to Google. And Google plays favorites. So when I'm looking for you or looking for something, if there are other websites that are considered websites of authority that link to my website, that means I will be found in the search engines faster. I will go, I, my rank will increase. So if I can get seven days to write about me and the article is online and maybe they link to my website, they have high authority. If I have random Joe Blogger, not so much. But if I have um, Elaine's stylish wedding fashions that everybody pays attention to and reads all the time because I'm just so good and I have like a hundred thousand people visiting my blog every day and then I write about this great little boutique in Vermont who knew what a great discovery you have to check this out and then bam here comes all this traffic right so the power of earned media and influencer marketing is to increase it helps increase your visibility both to people coming to you but also for search engines to say oh People of authority and the sites of authority like them, therefore they are useful to others, therefore we will make them number one. There's a lot of other things that go into SEO, but this is a big piece of why this is important. So you don't talk about Craigslist at all. So Craigslist can be very helpful depending on what your product or service is. It is one of those areas that's sort of like a little gray. So we run a vacation rental business yeah. inside another business, right. and we go in there every other day, update one word for it's the top of the list. Right, but that, but that's in Craigslist, right? That's in their world. So basically, what they do as soon as you update fresh content, they put you up at the top, which is different from Google, which is looking for people saying, "I'm looking for a great vacation rental." Will I find your Craigslist rental <coughs> listing if I type "looking for a great vacation rental in Vermont"? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not, right? Uh, so if you're staying in the, the kind of walled garden of Craigslist and you want to keep your content fresh in front of people, you do that work. If you are talking about some person looking for a vacation rental in Vermont, then where else might you need to be so that they bypass Airbnb? Or do you want to be in Airbnb now? We use that also. Yeah, yeah, so that, and that was something that didn't exist not too long ago. So it is knowing that landscape. Yeah. Can I just ask a question about the Google Display Network? Yeah. Um, you can do remarketing via Google. Yes. So, so remarketing would be you put some information on your website, some code. You don't necessarily have to do that. You can have a web developer do that for you. 
when I come to your website, then you, you know, you've all seen that. You go to say Amazon and you're looking for say a kayak. And then suddenly everywhere you go, the kayak follows you around. <laughs> and you're like, now I didn't buy it. I still don't want it, but it's still following me. <laughs> and you'll see it in Facebook. You'll see it when you go to a news website. Uh, say, if you go to the free press, you'll see it there. It's like, well, I see it in Twitter now, in Twitter. Instagram, see them in Instagram, just keep coming. And so the idea is, if it's done well and done right, it reminds people that you exist. If it's done really, really well and you bail out at a um, shopping cart, it's a way to go, hey, don't forget you wanted that kayak. Come on back and get it. <coughs> Depending on your business, it can be really interesting to consider using. It's not super expensive. It's built right into the display network, and it's just part of putting a code on your website. So the Google display network is the way to do remarketing? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I see those ads for things I didn't search for, but I talked about at home. I know. Now, now, is it? Now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. just, just, just talked about. And you have Alexa? No, I don't. But do you I have a mobile will. device? I have a cell phone. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Is it a smartphone or is yeah. it? A, yeah. It's real smart. <laughs> who, who is monitoring it? Well, you know, it, it's not a who, it's a what, right? I mean, and I, you know, I get suspicious about it too, because I'm like, okay, this is too much of a coincidence. They're really not listening to me. But I literally had a conversation the other night with someone, and then I opened up my phone to search for something, and there was an ad for the thing we just talked about. And I'm like, mm. You're talking voice? Voice, yeah. Not yeah, yeah. 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 And it's funny because when you sign up for things and you give them permission <laughs> to to use your yeah. your phones, um, yes, uh, microphone yeah. and all that, they're, yeah. they're always listening. <laughs> Whether your phone's on or not, yeah. they're always listening so, because you gave off. that permission. So, so when you use an app, so if you have, um, if you're using the Facebook app, any app on your smart device, you give them a set of permissions. And those permissions are there for a reason. Uh, and Google is also, if you have an Android phone, of course, Google is there to help you. Uh, their, their whole goal in life is to make things more convenient and, and make things easier for you. So, um, you know, I still haven't really dug into the whole, like, are they really, really listening kind of part, but it just, it, it, you know, you start to get at that pay space where you're like, wow. And with voice search. So I, I, I sell heat pumps. Okay. How do I get an ad to show up on somebody's web page, uh, Facebook when I, when they mention heat pump at their house? Yeah, right. Now, wouldn't that be great, right? I think it takes a little bit of money, right? Um, but there's ways. There's ways to think about what is, it's going to be a homeowner, it's going to be a certain time that they're going to need me, and then they're going to be looking for something right away. And so how do I insert myself in that space? Uh, so with voice search, there will be more changes in how people ask for and find out about things. So that, that is a big piece of where things are headed going forward that you really want to be paying attention to. It's a fun thing to think about. Um, Let's see. So this is how I want to show you. The important thing is to think about how all of these work together. So your owned social media and earned, even though social media is rented, is part of your organic reach. That is, I'm not paying for this. I'm writing content or creating content that will allow people to find me. That's that inbound approach. My email marketing and some of my social media, right, because I get people to comment on my posts and connect with me, is direct content, direct contact, outside of the face-to-face, -face, they walked into my store and we had a nice conversation part. And that can be wonderful to retain customers and build your client base. And then you've got this world of targeted visibility, your search, social, and display. So you'll see in your little handout there, I added the search, social, and display because I wanted to make sure that that was clear. You're going to pay for that. So you want to make sure you do this really, really well. When done really well, it can leverage your business quite nicely. 
done poorly, you can be paying a lot of money for nothing. So this part is real tricky. At least here, if you're not getting a lot out of it, you're not paying, you're paying time, but you're not paying, paying. Here, you're putting money on the table. So make sure when you do advertising that you're really focused on doing it well. But they should all work together. Oh, and by the way, notice I have this Bing thing here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't forget Bing. You're like, why do, what's Bing, right? Uh, so Bing being Microsoft search engine. You know, surprisingly enough, there's a good enough amount of people who use Bing. And if you're looking at your website <coughs> data and your analytics, <coughs> It's really interesting to see how many people from, come from Google, a ton, like Google's huge. But if you have this small group of people coming from Bing and you notice that they always convert, and you have all these people coming from Google and they don't, where do you wanna put your money? Right? And so think about that. So knowing some of that is really, really helpful. So I've got some questions for you. Um, I think we're doing good on time, Louise, yep. right? And so we've had a couple of these conversations, but let's talk about it. So remember I talked about your website and making, thinking of like your house and keeping it updated. When was the last time you updated your website? How fresh and current is your website right now? Anybody want to toss out a number? Like yesterday? Today? Yes? Okay. Excellent. And so was that because you posted some fresh content? Yeah, I was just working on wording on it and figuring out what content to post next. And do you have a blog on your site? I have a process of it, yeah. Okay. Uh, what about your design of your site? <coughs> um, right now I just started with Wix. Okay. Um, is that what you meant by design? Yeah, so you're using a Wix site. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do you own your domain? And you bought it through Wix? I'm, so I'm in the process of purchasing it. So yeah, it will be purchased. It's not owned. So you're not there yet. Yeah. You're in that in that process. Mm -hmm. The how many of your websites are responsive design? Responsive design meaning that it scales to fit whatever size screen someone is using. Okay, good. Responsive design, and the best the easiest way to find this out is. If you go and visit your website via your mobile device, is it easy to navigate on your mobile phone? Google Analytics data will tell you how many of the people who are coming to your website are coming via desktop or mobile and tablet. Know that. That's really important to be thinking about your website content because not only is it important just because you're reaching your audiences where they are, yay, we like that in marketing, but also because Google is going mobile first now. So they are saying in their search engine optimization that they will rank you better if you are mobile oriented. Yeah. Seems like I remember last year getting some sort of notice that if you, your rank would change or something mm -hmm. if you didn't, uh, if you weren't going to be mobile friendly. Yeah, yeah, it definitely will happen. Uh, the other thing that Google is doing, uh, how many of you have a secure uh, site? So HTTPS versus HTTP. Because Google now is going to um, actually penalize you if you don't have HTTPS. Now, if you don't know what I just said, put that on the list of things to talk about with the person who helps you with your website. If you are using a platform, say like WordPress, and you're kind of like going on your own, um, there should be a place where you can check a box to say, I want it to do this. There may be an additional charge if you host with a hosting company, so like Bluehost or HostGator, then they probably have a way for you to do it as well. It's all stuff on the server side. You don't have to do anything, but you need to tell them you want to do that. Highly recommend it, yes. Privacy? Uh, it's, yeah, it's like data security and encryption. They're basically saying it's a trusted site. Wants to add an $8 per year charge onto my yes. fee, and they call it privacy. Uh, hmm. 
That might be different. That might be different. That would be, I can't look up and see that the website belongs to you and find your address. What you want to look is for the HTTPS secure socket layer. How often do you Google your business? Yeah, how often? Once a month? Once a year? Google knows where you are. Google knows who you are. And if, you are, if you're like me and use an Android phone, they know where I am on my Android phone when I go to my work computer. You know, they know every, where I am all the time. So if I want to Google myself, I need to make it look like I don't actually, like it shouldn't know me. And so there is a way in Chrome, which is the Google browser, to go incognito. In other words, don't do any of the cookie things that track me so I can see what I look like or what I can find anonymously. So you, you really want to make sure that you get found on your business name, but then are you getting found on those problem questions? Or can you get found on your product? Handcrafted custom furniture. Do, I get, do you get found if I type that into Google? Do you know? Type it in and find out. <coughs> so be thinking about being able to be found on your business name and then the products that you have. How many of you are actually engaging in email marketing? Hmm. So depending on your demographic, it is probably one of the most powerful, best tools to use still to retain your customers, to connect with your customers, to keep bringing people back. So if you're not doing email marketing, you should start. So we talked a little, bit, a little bit more about the social media platforms. Be really clear about why you're using, like if you're using Facebook, why are you using Facebook? What's the purpose of Facebook for you? Knowing what you know now, are you willing to put money on the table with Facebook? If you want Facebook to be successful for you, are you ready to have an advertising budget and boost and sponsor posts? Because that is how you will be able to be successful in Facebook if you have the right target market in Facebook. If you're looking for brand engagement, you're still going to have to boost those posts. <laughs> Think about why you would use Instagram. How could Instagram be useful for you, right? Think about those. And if you can't answer those questions, don't be on the platform. Pick one platform and do it really, really, really well and don't worry about the rest, right? So overall, where do you advertise? What is your advertising strategy? Because you can't get anything for free anymore. The golden days of social media are over. Thank you. You're welcome. So what, where are you going to spend money, how much of it are you going to spend, and how are you going to know that you're successful in that advertising spend? Do you know who's talking about your brand? Do any of you have a Google Alert set up for your brand? I got one. So Google has a great little tool, so you can Google it. <laughs> Google Alert. And what you can do is you can say, OK, whenever somebody online mentions, so writes my name or my business name associated with, say, Vermont or something, I'll get an email. So like when I do something uh, and I'm in the newspaper, I have a Google alert for Elaine Young, in quotes, mm -hmm. plus Champlain College, in quotes. So that when Elaine Young from Champlain College did this thing, I get a ping and I can see, oh, Wow, I, I did this thing for the Burlington Free Press a couple weeks ago. They did this little video. And now that video is part of an editorial for some newspaper in the Midwest. It's like, oh, well, that's cool. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's all part of Gannett, but hey, great. Now I know they did that. So no, who's talking about you? How are you connecting your own paid and earned content, right? Think about it systematically and holistically. Think about it how each piece feeds the other. Don't think in silos. Don't just, okay, I'm just going to do this one thing. You have to think about what can you manage and how are you getting a little piece of each one? How are you doing your own? How much paid can you do? And how do you leverage earned? 
right? And how do they work together for your brand? And I've alluded to this on more than one occasion tonight, but it really is about measuring your success, okay? How do you know you're doing well? For some people, if I get people walking in the door, that's great. That's what I want. But if you don't have a door for people to walk into, are you looking at your analytics data? So Google Analytics is free. If you are using uh, WordPress, they have a plugin so that you can actually have a dashboard and see how many people are coming to my site, where are they coming from. It can actually be a little overwhelming. But if you're really into numbers, it's kind of cool. Facebook analytics, right? Are you looking at your Facebook insights? If you're using Twitter, are you looking at Twitter analytics? Because that can be really interesting. Instagram has analytics. Snapchat does too now, right? Because they're moving into that ad space. So how successful are you being? And think about it as a, as a funnel. How many people came to my site because of this thing I did? When they got to my site, what action did they take? Did they take the action I wanted them to take? And then what did they do? And that part is incredibly important. So this makes a whole, whole big piece of all the basics that keep shifting. So this is good for now. It could change tomorrow. But right now, this is what we've got. Yeah. What are your thoughts on, we do a lot of uh, email classes to our existing customers and vendors. Right. What are your thoughts on uh, using a 30 second infomercial as opposed to text? I love that question. Who is your target market? Uh, cu customers that we, we are, we're a lending resource. Okay. So the customers that we loan money to. Okay. And are, they, are they individual people that you loan money to? Businesses. Businesses, okay. And so when you send that email to the business, who is the business person who will open it? The owner? Okay. Roughly, what's the age range of the owner? We're all over the board. All over the board. So you're talking, it could be 18 to 99. No, it's usually 25 and up. 25 and up. Okay. Uh, so my question would be, have you asked them what, if they would like to get a video? And if you did, and say... A group of them said yes. Can you segment your list and only send them the video? No. You should be able to. And so here I'll tell you why. Uh, there is a segment of the population, while none of us mind watching video, there's a segment of the population that um, is going to find that time consuming. So I can read a lot faster than that video can tell me anything. Mm -hmm. Right? So there's a segment of the population that's going to be in that headspace, right? And then there's a segment of the population that's like, I'm a visual, I want to see the video, I'm totally down for that. But you don't really know in your grouping who those people are. So my advice would be to find that out first, ask them. And then when they give you their preferences, then figure out how to segment your list so that you can highlight those people who want video and those people who don't. That's more sophisticated, sophisticated email marketing, but then you can then measure, of the people getting the video, how many people are doing the thing that we're advising them to do. Maybe it's sign up for a class or get a new product or do something like that, versus the people we just send print to. And then, then you've got some really interesting data.